Carl Weinberg of High Frequency Economics, and he will drag in here Ian Shepherdson as well. Wonderful to have both of you here with this. I assume this is like client visits in New York? Absolutely. Because Ian's yep. usually in London. Um, what is the major message to your clients right now? His message is the U.S. is looking good, and my message is the rest of the world ain't looking so good. And uh, the new message is, I think, look at dollars as a as a place for some gains. The dollar is a safe haven. As a safe again, haven. Higher interest rate regime. Well, the interest rates don't sway me. I mean, Europeans might raise interest rates by 25 basis points, but look at we've got three countries on the verge of default. Doesn't look like a safe place to put money. 25 basis points doesn't convince me to shift all my funds over right. there. Right. Dreaded first chart. Let's go right to it, folks. The news today out of Portugal. For those that don't know, Carl Weinberg has been way, way out in front of this. High real rates kill business. This is the real rate, the 10-year Portugal note, minus a form of Portuguese inflation. And it's really not that, it's, it's a high rate regime. Can they, it's just assume assumption they have recession, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. And it's even scarier, Tom, if you plot out the nominal rate, which is what they actually have to come up with, what they have to, the, what they have to pay out of their uh, current income. That's really scary. That's around uh, 8% and uh, continuing to rise uh, to new record high levels. The problem is one of unaffordability for the government. And then, as you point out, for the economy, one of high interest rates squeezing, uh, high mm -hmm. real interest rates squeezing demand. Uh, we're going to go back and forth there, international and domestic, but I want to talk about housing today. Here is vacancies away from case show you can see down here in a vacancy jump condition and what's great about this chart of home vacancies a one percent statistic up to near three percent is we are at one level and then we jumped right up and we have sustained there are we in any way clearing our market and pr providing for less vacancies Progress is slow, I've got to say, it's really slow. Um, sales are hanging in about the five million mark on the existing home market, but we, you know, we've got still several million uh, foreclosed homes. We've got shadow inventory that we don't really know about yet. And it's going to take a long, long time unless demand really okay. picks up. Jargon alert, jargon alert. I, you, everybody tosses this around. I was sitting with my children going, you've got shadow inventory in the closet. What is shadow inventory? Homes that, that eventually will find their way onto the market but aren't officially listed as yet. Uh, and uh, an unknowable number, but probably uh, several million. So they're like spouses in kitchens arguing about when to list the house? Well, it's more likely that it's banks wondering whether they're going to take possession and then how long they're going to hold on to it and whether they're going to sell them in a hurry. Well, they're not at the moment. That mm. About a third of the market now for existing homes is foreclosure sales, but that could go up. Uh, Case Schiller today, I want both of you to comment on this. Case Schiller over here, uh, and it's on the edge of a double dip. This is the year-over-year -year national. Up we go, boom, down we go, we go up, yes, we got over the zero line, and then, like like Rex says, here we go again. Is it a double dip recession? No, it's not. Housing it's recession? Not. It's not. What, what happened was that prices was, were firm in the middle of last year because of the home buyer tax credit. And when that expired, big drop in volumes, prices dropped as well. If you look at the monthly trend rather than the year over year, October, November, they were falling at 1%. The latest reading is just minus 0 0.2. So the rate of decline on a monthly basis is slowing. And I think by the spring, we're going to see stable home prices. Do you guys ever disagree? Do you, do you agree with this? I agree with him entirely. We're seeing a very similar Similar thing in the UK, though, but without such happy circumstances on the other side. We've seen house prices go way down, come back up to zero, and now start to go down again. But we don't nearly have the optimism in the UK because of the tightness of credit to home buyers that we're going to see these price increases resume. You mentioned the UK, Spain. Everybody in Germany bought a home in Spain, from what I can tell. Spain. The zeitgeist is has been ring fenced in the last three or four days. Do you buy it? Well, I am not sure that Spain's going to be able to remain above the fracas if Portugal goes into a special program, because this has been kind of a sequential decay of confidence in governments. And people believe, rightly or wrongly, that the Spanish banks have a lot of exposure to Portugal. People believe that uh, Spanish banks are in trouble anyhow. Right. And people also don't believe that the European Union and the IMF have an appropriate solution to the problem. You wrote thoughtful notes over a year ago about restructuring with your experience working with what I'll call the Brady workout of South America and such. I may have that phrase wrong, but why can't the elites of Europe get to a sensible discussion to clear the markets when I see interest rates where they are? 
I don't have an answer for you as to why restructuring isn't in the forefront. They have a vehicle to allow this to happen. The European uh, Financial Stability Fund has the capacity to buy bonds from the market, to give them back to the government and swap them for longer-term bonds and send them back out. I have no idea why they don't pursue mm -hmm. it. It's absolutely, in my mind, the right thing to do. It's the only tool they have on the table right now that can help them. Harold Weinberg and Ian Shepardson, the respect uh, for the history involved. Bring up the chart right away. Food. Wheat, data check, wheat up 1.4%, $7.35 per bushel. Real food, the UN index, adjusted for inflation, and there's the gift that was 1999 to 2006. Are we seeing the unrest that we're going to talk to Ian Bremmer about later in the hour? Is the catalyst for all the unrest in the Middle East just food prices? Just I think food prices have got to be a part of it. I'm no expert on the Middle East. But in the developing world, when people are living at or near subsistence and food prices go up, that means they have less to eat. It's not like in the United States and the G7 countries where we're rich and food prices go up. We just spend less on DVDs or other things that we do. It's deflationary to our other expenditures. But if you don't have any discretionary expenditures to cut and food prices go up, then you're hungry. Right. That can't be a good food thing. Food in the United States. All the economists say, it's you know, no big deal, da, da, da. And then I get the letters from everybody saying they're getting killed at the grocery store. $3.50, $3.60. How much is a gallon of gas in London? Any idea? Oh, it's about double what it is here. So. <laughs> nine dollars? or It's not quite nine, but it's not far short. But it's much more important than food prices. Okay. If food is going up, undoubtedly. You've got wages growing here at one and a half percent year over year. And food prices, I think, by the end of this year will be probably up five. So it hurts. People really feel it. It really feel it. Well, there's another chart. I want to dive right in. we got some good charts here with Weinberg and Shepardson. This is just jobs plentiful, jobs not so plentiful. It's an elegant chart. And what I love about this chart with all the, it looks like the guy in Mad Magazine, Spy or whatever. Over on the right side, the white line hasn't budged. That's jobs plentiful. They have not come back, even if not so plentiful has done better. This is that asymmetry with jobless yeah. claims, isn't it? It is, yeah. We're not seeing hiring really picking up yet, but I've got to say I'm hopeful. Looking ahead over the next couple of quarters, I would be very surprised if we don't see a real pickup in, in payroll growth. And I think that we've clearly seen a slowdown in the pace of firing. We've got to see a pickup in the pace of hiring, but the surveys mm. are starting to point in that direction. The ISMs and the monster numbers are getting better. Yeah. Carl, in jobs in Europe, is it just institutionalized at double-digit and uh, unemployment's acceptable? No, I don't think it's institutionalized, and I don't think it's acceptable. It's also very rarely spoken about by the ECB and even by policymakers because it's uncomfortable to have 10 percent unemployment that's not going down. I mean, we flirted with 9.9 percent last month. I think we'll be back up above uh, 10 in the monthly report that's coming out this week. It's a problem. The high unemployment is keeping wages down, though, and that means there's not inflation, no matter what the ECB Why tells you. Why is going to raise? Don't listen to him. All right, whatever. If he tells you there's inflation, that's there's a not exclusive. inflation. That's a great exclusive. Carl Weinberg, Sarah Banner that, Weinberg. Don't listen to Triche. Okay, now yeah. what? <laughs> there is no inflation in Europe. The ECB may raise interest rates, but what we're seeing in Europe is the same thing we're seeing in here, a relative rise in the price of energy and food compared mm -hmm. to other goods and services. There is no inflation. Wages are not going up, and they can't go up for the same reason they're not going up okay. here. Unemployment's high. Brad DeLong said the same thing yesterday on the show. Talk to us about an absolute, uh, the way we should measure inflation versus the relative rise your colleague just spoke of. Well, we've got a core rate which is probably the least bad of the indicators that we have. There's no perfect way of measuring inflation. The core is dominated in the U.S. by rent, and we can argue all day about whether that's appropriate. But the fact is that's what the, the Fed looks at. That's what they care about more. They know that the rise in headline is, is transitory, and they know it'll come back down again, provided there's no wage response. Mm -hmm. And so far, you know, there's no sign of that at all. There's no wage response. And I want to bring this up. Savings, and also savings in Europe. This is personal savings to GDP. Too little or too much savings. Marty Feldstein has spoken eloquently about this about a real risk if there's too much savings. We've gone level there, which is help consumption, I assume. Yeah. Where do you want savings to be for a healthy American economy? About where it is now. You know, we've had an enormous upswing from a, a horribly negative rate to a substantially positive rate. I don't want it to go any higher. But now that it's positive, uh, once we get payrolls going, people will have income and savings so they can spend and continue deleveraging at the same time. If you've got a you flow of them? savings. Yes, absolutely. What about in Europe? I mean, there's two Europes for starters. Can Germany have an American-like economy, or are they just beholden to the euro? I think that if we're talking about savings specifically, I don't think there are going to be enough savings in Europe to deal with the financial requirements that are coming up. Right. We have a banking system that still has to be tarped. We have sovereign, we have sovereign debt crisis. Oh, I love that. Tarped. Tarped. That's a verb. 
Can I use that with my kids this weekend? If you can explain it to them, you can. You're going to get tarped if you don't clean up your room. I like that. <laughs> but they're going to need to raise money to recapitalize banks. They're going to need to raise money to recapitalize countries. And the price tag for that is going to be, uh, S&P estimates, 350 billion euros just for the banking system alone under the scenario that they tested. The number could be higher than that. It could be lower. It could be higher. But that's just the starting point. Plus, we have their fiscal deficits that have to be. How much? How much of a haircut will the commercial banks be asked to take? It's, you know, if they restructured right now, they don't need to take a haircut on the sovereign debt. Mm -hmm. Okay, if they if they restructured today, they could blow out all the debt due over the next six or seven or eight years out to thirty years, and it would be a very affordable. A Brady profile. bond like exactly just what we did in Mexico and Brazil and Argentina back in the day. Why? Can't that happen? Don't ask me. The politicians are being thrown out of office. You think they'd dial 1 800 Weinberg or Lipsky or whoever and just say, let's get this done? Ask them. I'd like to know the answer that you get. Okay, we'll get Christine Lagarde on and we'll, 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 we'll do that. Ian, I want to bring up this chart. This chart is so good. Elegant chart two. Elegant chart two. If we can bring it up here. Sorry, guys. I did an audible there on, on, on Rex. Okay, this is, I love this chart. I took broad dollar in trade-weighted major, and I normalized them to the Plaza Accord in 1985. So the fiction of a strong dollar is that, you know, that white line under there is trade-weighted major without China, and the yellow line up top is that huge gift that we got, that strong dollar for years that helped, and then we rolled over. We got a long way to go to bring broad dollar back to anywhere near where it was. I mean. I mean, broad trade-weighted major could definitely weaken a lot further, couldn't it? Well, I'm not sure, Tom. I'm thinking that right now the U United States looks like a pretty safe place to put money. And interest rate differentials notwithstanding, I don't think investors want to go to Europe and dabble with the risk of sovereign defaults. I don't think they want to go to Japan and deal with the unknowable. I don't think they want to go to the U.K., where growth prospects are really very weak right now. They may want to go to China, but for people committed to the mm -hmm. industrial G7 countries for investment, I think the dollar is looking better and better as we move forward. An outright strong dollar, like euro to 130 or something like that? You know, two years ago, the euro was at 160. Last year, it was 150 before the crisis. Now we're struggling to hold on to 140. Right. The long-term trend is down. Bring up the Rosenberg op-ed. This was just out moments ago. Folks, we work on these graphics right to the beginning of 12 noon. It is a note. Uh, this from David's uh, Rosenberg. The outlook for the U.S. consumer is grim. Much of the payroll tax cut is now being absorbed by higher food and energy costs. Gas prices have jumped more than 50 cents. Ian Shepardson, is the consumer grim in the United States? You don't agree, do you? Short term, it's rocky just because of the rise in gas prices is a, undoubtedly a hit. But payroll growth accelerating is the big story, I think, for the next two or three quarters. And that changes everything. If you get a pickup in payrolls, you'll get a pickup in sentiment to follow through from that, and people will have more cash. So certainly tricky in the short term, but I don't think it's the end of the world. Does inflation eat away at their payroll, or do we, we keep with... A quiet inflation. Well, you know, headline CPI is going to get up to about 3%, and that's tricky. You know, if your wages are only growing at one and a half, then you've got mm -hmm. to have payroll growth if you want to have overall incomes getting a bit ahead of inflation. But I've got to say, Tom, I don't want strong consumption this year. I want the consumer to hold back and make space for capital spending, for inventory building, and for net foreign trade to generate the growth, okay. to rebalance the economy. Last word, Ian Shepardson. You could have a last word next time. Carl Weinberg <laughs> and Ian Shepardson, thank you so much from High Frequency Economics.